Much of the inefficiency so often complained of in the Lutheran Church is doubtless due to the loose adhesion of its members to the doctrinal exponents of her faith. 1854 Hey, Internet! Uh-oh, 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 hey, Mal. Paul writes, Would you consider doing a worldview everlasting devoted just to the Book of Concord sometime? I'd love to see how you would treat this with your own unique... Ho, ho, ho! I would like to buy a hamburger. What is the Book of Concord, and why should every Protestant have a copy that is well-read, well-marked, and falling apart? There's several ways that I could answer this question, so one way would be to talk about where the book came from. That would make a great video, but it's not going to be the video I make today. The best resource for that is actually the Concordia Lutheran Confessions Reader's Edition from Concordia Publishing House, because it's tough to understand any document apart from its history. But I want to talk today instead about the devotional value of the Book of Concord, the doctrinal symbol of the true church on earth, purely aligned with Scripture, so normed by Scripture that you can norm all of their teaching according to it. This book has value for you, for fun. The Lutheran Church, in its rebuttal against Rome and rebuttal against the radicals, said, this is what we teach, this is what we will always teach, because this is what the Bible teaches. We hope to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, confessing these very words. These words are from his mouth. We're just speaking them back, confessing. This is my copy of the Book of Concord? It really was my wife's. She bought it while attending Concordia University, Irvine, and she had to take a class. I was a bit of a zealous Lutheran Methodist charismatic guy who really liked my wife and wanted to marry her. And so I came down from where I was teaching high school to visit her every weekend, and I saw this book sitting on her desk, and I said, what's this? And she said, oh, it's a book I have to read for this class. It's the doctrine of our church. And I picked up this, this very copy right here, and I said, away with these teachings of men. Why do we need traditions of men? And I was very angry that, you know, my church body would have something other than the Bible, which somehow I was supposed to learn from. Didn't really look at the book again until my second year at seminary. I think I had to look at it officially my first year, but would you believe that in my Confessions 1 and 2 class, we spent more time reading other books than reading the Confessions? I mean, come on, profs, you can't assign 300 pages in two days in four classes and expect the guys to do the work. They're going to read the one you're going to talk about, which happened to not be the actual Confessions. So for some bizarre reason, midway through my second year. I couldn't find anything to read before going to bed, and you can't go to borders at 10.30 at night. And so I picked up the large catechism portion of the Book of Concord, and I started reading. And this thing sat on my bedside table for the next, I don't know, six months, as I poured through what I seemed to have never found before. The most amazing, pure statement of what I had always wanted to believe Christianity was about. Since that day, I have not stopped reading this book, but I try to read a little bit of it every day. It confirms and affirms my faith. Not my faith, but what scripture says that I can believe and know to be true. That next year on Vicarage, I made it a plan to read through the entire thing. Took my pencil. I marked the sucker up, put little comments. You know how you always do that as a Protestant with the first Bible you get is you go and you highlight everything and then you can't really read it anymore because you can't highlight it anymore. And so I finally gave up on highlighting it and I tried to move over to the Concordia edition, but I couldn't do it. I just, this is, you know, it's like an old book. You love it. And so uh, it's all marked up. Entire pages are underlined because uh, unlike that Protestant practice of to just underline all the phrases about what you're supposed to do and what other people ought to be doing and gosh, I wish people were like that and they'd hear this part. The Book of Concord's focus and center and heart is justification, not what you're doing for God, not your response, but what God is done is doing in Christ and Spirit for you via word and sacrament. We confess new obedience, we confess law, we confess good works, the civil order, all this stuff, but all of it is read through the filter, the lens, of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. On top of that, there's this amazing pattern to the way that the reformers handled all of their arguments, no matter what it was, whether it was dealing with, say, original sin, or dealing with the distinctions of foods being made by Roman Catholics, or whether it was dealing with Zwingli and his radical interpretation 
interpretation of the Lord's Supper which undermined classic Christology and the doctrine of the two natures in Christ, no matter what issue they were dealing with, they always followed the same pattern. Here's the issue. Here's what this issue can do to the gospel. Here's where scripture says this. Here's where the church fathers say this. Here sometimes is where Luther says this. So that every single issue, every single time is not just a matter of me in a corner with my Bible or us three in a corner with our Bible saying, well, we think it means this. Every time it is the testimony of the church. But there is nothing particularly Luther in about it at all. It is Christian. These are the evangelical confessions of the true Catholic Church on earth. Page one is the Apostles' Creed. There's nothing in it that hasn't been taught by Christians in every place, everywhere, except for the radical Protestants. Silly radicals. Ho, ho, ho. You would like to buy a am burger. So I would recommend to you, the first thing you should do is open to the middle and read Luther's large catechism because it's just the most profound, pious Christian document ever penned. And then move over to the Augsburg Confession and see what the church has taught in every time and place that it has truly been the church. No, not all Christians have always believed it everywhere because Christians make mistakes. And no, those who are in heaven will not only be those who believed all these teachings perfectly, but when they get to heaven, they will believe all these teachings perfectly because it is perfect teaching. Yes, true doctrine is possible. There's a nice little document here. Hi Myrtle. I'll put a link to it below on the YouTube page. It's got some great stuff about how the Book of Concord is pastoral, how it's a book of comfort, promise, and how it can help pastors learn to be better pastors, how to know, how to engage, how to discern. Nothing teaches discernment better than the Book of Concord. They are practical, unlike this book, and this book, and this book, and oh my gosh, this completely impractical, useless piece of junk people. Those books aren't practical and they're unfaithful. The Book of Concord is practical. It tells you how to apply theology to real life questions. So someone comes along and says that you can only eat certain kinds of foods if you really want to be a good person. How does this affect Christianity? Should we absorb this kind of teaching? Should we teach that this is true? Oh man, that's not practical. No one in our day and age is doing that ever. It's practical. They are personal. One of the most powerful pieces of the Book of Concord is the piety of the writers. It is so clear that these men believed what they were saying. It was deep. It impacted their lives. It impacted their faith. They were on fire for Jesus, although not the way that the radicals were. Instead of on fire, I should say they were washed, they were clean, they were sanctified, and they were alive, regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God. It's clear in the way that they write. But what about the Bible? I just believe in the Bible. Do you know the phrase, I just believe in the Bible, is not in the Bible? Hey. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. In the formula of Concord Solid Declaration on Rule and Norm, paragraph 9, we confess the Word of God, aka the Bible, is and should remain the sole rule and norm of all doctrine. This is, and don't just believe it, go read it and find it out, the reason the Lutheran Confessions will just feed your soul. It lifts up the Bible, it strengthens and girds and affirms your being pointed back to the Bible. There is no place where it overturns the Bible. This book denies the Bible. This book does it too. And I don't have a copy of the Heidelberg Catechism, but on a couple of pretty important issues, it denies the Bible too. So anyway, the point is, this is not a replacement for the Bible, and this is not another testimony of Jesus Christ. What this is, is what the church, throughout time and space, until today, has publicly and in unity confessed to maintain what Scripture says. Think of it as training wheels or those little gutter lanes they put on the bully alley for the kids. Scripture is the lane. Confessions are the gutter protectors. Someone comes to you with a one passage of the Bible and they say, here's what this thing says. If you know your confessions well, you can know whether or not it's true, whether or not it's acceptable, whether or not it smells kind of fishy. This is not basic instructions before leaving earth. This is basic instructions for discerning false teachers. Anyway, this wonderful little document has a little bit of history on all the different pieces of the Book of Concord, which we don't have time to get to today. But it's really a neat little document here. But I think the best advice it gives in the whole thing, how do I start? Pick it up and read. If you don't like to read, you got other... These kids are yeah. placed at an unfair disadvantage. You know, students who don't care enough to read through to the end of a word problem have an 89% lower chance of answering it correctly. How are the kids who don't care going to get ahead? That's right. Thank you know, you. the deck is stacked against the child whose pencil breaks mm -hmm. and then he doesn't feel like getting up to go sharpen it and so mm -hmm. he just chooses right. fingernails right. for the rest and of the day. We need to test these kids on what they know, not what we want them to know. Issues. But see, that just doesn't really jive with Christianity tremendously well. One of the things Christianity has always done is taught people how to read. There's a reason for that, because we want you to read the Bible. And in the Lutheran Church, we want you to read your catechism. And your catechism is the core document in your... Confess. I would 
Lake Tua 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 Tua